you know, we have that just in case. Uh, so uh, we'll get started. Um, I will pass this question over to um, David and Julie, but uh, can we go ahead and get some of the background on Colkin Vineyards? How did your family get started in the wine business? Um, and kind of talk a little bit about the background of Colkin Vineyards. Okay. I was going to take this one, Dave, and let you talk about the terroir of Colkin Vineyards, which is the next one. Um, so Colkin Vineyards was planted by our parents uh, in 1995. Uh, my father got early retirement. He had worked uh, corporate life with IBM and decided he didn't want to stay in Dallas any longer. Uh, and so they moved to, they actually looked around quite, quite thoroughly looking for a site for Colkin Vineyards. Uh, I was out in California and dad went out to uh, UC Davis uh, to get information as to you know, what soil types would be best. Uh, so it was still a relatively new thing to have a vineyard in the, the hill country or in central Texas. So um, anyway, they, they landed on the site that we have, which is north of Fredericksburg, about 11 and a half miles north. Turns out it is within, or part of it is within, the oldest uh, ABA or American Viticultural Area in Texas, which is Bell Mountain ABA, which is a very small ABA within the Texas Hill Country. It actually preceded it by, I think, six or seven years. Um, so anyway, they planted in the spring of 95. So we are looking at our 25th anniversary this year. Uh, we haven't been able to do as much to celebrate it as we would have liked to, uh, just because of everything going on. Uh, but anyway, they started with, I mean, at the time they did, they had no intention of having a winery. They only wanted to grow grapes. Uh, and they planted what they could sell at the time, which were the usual suspects, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it was immediately evident within a year or two that whites were not going to be a thing <laughs> in our location. Uh, the whites never thrived very well. The Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot uh, did fairly well uh, and we continued to grow them until just only the residual parts of that original planting were just it's only a few years ago uh, that we were still still had them. We still have um, uh, some Merlot uh, that got planted later, but it was part of that original uh, planting. Um, anyway, we were just having a discussion. What was the first vintage of Colkin Vineyards? It turns out that, I mean, in 2006, David and I formed Pedernella Cellars. So, uh, and what we, the, the nice thing that we had, which most people who start a vineyard do not have, is that we, or start a winery, is that we immediately had a vineyard, a, a relatively mature vineyard to draw grapes from, uh, which we did. Uh, and it turned out that we bottled it as a family reserve, which is a wine we still have. Family reserve has gone on to be sort of the best lots, but from all sourcing, like the High Plains, any place for sourcing fruit. And so the, that program changed, but in effect, that first family reserve was a Colcan Vineyards reserve, because it was all from Colcan Vineyards. And so it was a Merlot Cabernet Sauvignon blend, uh, primarily, uh, that was most of what was in the original four four ish acres that my parents had planted so uh, or our parents had planted anyway in 2000 as I said, we started in 2006 with Pedernal Cellars 2007 we needed to expand the vineyard uh, and we did and that was where we made our big you know big bet on Tempranillo uh, and most of these blends as we go through them you'll realize there's a lot of Tempranillo in them and the reason for that is about 50 percent of the vineyard is Tempranillo. So logically enough, Colcan Vineyards uh, Reserve ends up being a, a Tempranillo dominant blend for the most part. The other thing we planted were the Portuguese varietals, uh, one of which is infamous. The, the infamous one is Tariga Nacional, which is a difficult grape to grow, wonderful grape uh, in, the, in the cellar. It's just a, a pain in the vineyard, uh, but it's, it's become a, an important part of our program. Uh, and then we also planted the Rhone varietals uh, that became the basis of the GSM or Grenache Syrah Mourvedre blend. Uh, and particularly the Mourvedre tends to feature in uh, the Colca Vineyards Reserve, as you'll see. So um, anyway, we are currently, I mean, just to say that was 2007, we are currently in a program of replanting. Uh, and as part of that, we will actually introduce some new varietals. And I'll let Dave talk about that in addition to talking about the terroir and you know, the vineyard site itself. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so David, kind of building on what Julie was talking about, um, I know that you were um, a guiding influence uh, for some of the replanting uh, that happened in 2007 and then obviously again right now. 
Um, what helped you decide to plant so much Tempranillo and some of these other varietals? Uh, and why did your dad think that was a great idea and all of that? Can you kind of talk about that and then also about some of the new planting that we're doing? Sure, I appreciate it. So, I mean, we, um, you know, as Julie was mentioning, we came into this business in 2006 and 2007 timeframe and the replanting or that the additional planting was part of that. Um, so to some degree, the decision to do that was like a, a group family decision, but it was kind of spearheaded, I think, by Julie and I wanting to kind of move ahead with what we felt like was gonna be the future of like the kind of the varietal mix that works for Texas. Um, Tempranillo was one of the few that was a little proven out in so much as there was enough Tempranillo planted before 2007 to give us an idea that you could really make a good high quality wine from that. Um, some of that would be the Alamosa plantings that were up at, um, at their site where Jim Johnson and Karen Johnson planted. And also Neil Newsom had planted a good bit of Tempranillo out of his site in West Texas. So that one, though we did have that in experimental rows for a couple of years prior to 2007, we felt confident about. Some of the others were just based on kind of our beliefs about what ought to work in Texas. and seven planting. The goal was to build a good base program for doing, of course, like the Colkin Vineyard Reserve, but also looking at what we felt like would be the right blend strategy to just generally grow high quality grapes here in Texas. And so a mix of those key varietals that you would grow in central Spain, as well as things you might grow in the Rhone were kind of the, the foundation of that. Um, and they, they incorporate relatively well from a sort of a terroir point of view, a soil point of view. Like we're, what's interesting about that site back there is, is that it's an interesting mix of different sections. We have some sandier soils with caliche underneath in one area, whereas we have a mix that's a little bit more sandstone um, with some granitic components in the upper part of that back vineyard. And so we actually were sort of distributed the different blocks throughout those to get a little bit of a mix. So there's a lower tempranillo block in the sandier soils, which is a little bit more similar to what we see in some of the high plains. Uh, in terms of soil mix and then also some of that granitic soil up at the top and there are differences between those blocks um, both in terms of vigor and just the qualities we get on the grapes um, but it has been you know like so we planted all this in 2007 we've learned a lot in the process i think we've learned that most of these varietals can work now granted some of them are not necessarily the sort of varietals that you're going to find being planted in large scale commercially in texas particularly things like the Tariga in part, just because of the yields. Um, I mean, we yield probably about a ton and a half an acre, maybe two on a real big year. Um, and even in some of the High Plains vineyards where yields are typically higher, it's still very low yielding grape. Now that's fantastic for doing a high end reserve like this. And so you, I think you'll see it for that purpose, but you're probably not gonna see it planted widely um, or distributed widely just because <laughs> yeah, the math on that is tough for any grower to, to work with. So, um, but we are, you know, like we're, we're continuing like on the, the new plantings, we're replanting some varietals that we, we feel strongly about still. So we're actually putting more Tariga back in, putting Tempranillo back in, but we are adding in some things that we've also had some good experiences with outside of our own vineyard and want to now bring into our own program. So as an example, Petit Syrah is actually getting planted as part of the new, new plantings. Um, and we're additionally expanding on a few varietals that are already there. Things like Grenache, we're gonna be doing more of, and actually a little bit of Sangiovese as well. Um, now that last one, whether we'll blend it in with this program is sort of a different you know, question because occasionally with some of these family, or the Colkin Reserves, we've actually done some Sangiovese in there. But it's such a small component that, um, you know, with a larger planting, we'd be able to do other things that might be outside of this, you know, Colton Vineyard Reserve. So, anyway. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I guess this one kind of goes back to you as well. But uh, a lot of the times when we're doing tastings in person, um, folks ask us, how, how do you make a blend? So the Colkin Vineyard Reserve is always a blend. Um, but how do you make the decisions that go into these blends? Um, I know by limiting on vineyard, we kind of limited what varietals are going to go in there. But when you do um, processing the fruit, making the choice to do it manually versus 
and that sort of thing. And then aging the fruit, how do you go through and make the red blends? Wow. Um, yeah, that's a long question, I guess. And it, it, there are, there's some guiding principles, I think, to what we start with in terms of, you know, we even plan on some assumptions about the kind of the fruit balance that would go into a blend. And Tempranillo was planted with larger volume in part because we felt like it would be a good backbone component for this blend. Um, and similarly, we, you know, we brought in those smaller amounts of things like Tariga and Tintamarella in part because we felt like those can make a lot of impact in a very, fairly small proportion. So again, you see them in that mix with those, at least that in mind up front. But it's really only until we get into the vintage and get into the growing year that we even have an idea of what we're going to be seeing, not just in terms of those, you know, how, how much fruit we're going to see out of those blocks, but it's also just really what kind of characteristics they're developing um, and then what carries on from that when we harvest and bring it in the cellar. So it's kind of an evolving process. We have a plan in mind every vintage, but of course the circumstances of every vintage change what we do, both what happens in the vineyard and then of course, you know, how that develops once we get to the cellar. And we can get into that a little bit as we start to talk about these individual vintages and we'll kind of, you can get it, I can kind of talk more in detail about the mix between what, you know, like our, like what the intentions are up front and how the process changes what we blend. But there is some, there's a degree of consistency to these and that it is year after year, it tends to be a blend where we have a Tempranillo as a foundation um, and then we are pulling in Tariga and then some varietals like Grenache, Mavad, others that can bring some more red fruit and some lighter components, maybe some acidity into the blend that are intended to create that overall balance. Because Tariga can be really strong, for example, on these good deep red cherry notes, maybe some earthiness, but that's not all that we want in the blend. And so other varieties they like the Tariga, it can bring in these tobaccos and leather and some dark fruit components, as well as some real strong tannins. And we can also then turn to things like the Grenache and the Mohead in order to get some mid palate, some range, some red fruit, and just other notes that, that each, and each year is gonna be different, right? But we can then pull on those in order to kind of construct an overall balance of blend. So, and again, all of that, the seller choices then, you know, kind of go to the individual lots about what kind of oak and what kind of aging they'll need in order to get to the finish line. So, so that sounds an awful lot like you're walking through the vineyard and eating the grapes throughout the year and then walking through the cellar and tasting the wine out of the barrel throughout the year. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like all, <laughs> it changes all the way up to the end. Like whatever we thought we were going to do like two years out is not necessarily what we wind up with. So, but yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well then, um, I mean, I guess we'll move into the wines and I'll ask some of my aging questions um, or if you want Julie to talk a little bit briefly about aging before we get too far into the wines. Um, just what, because this Vulcan Vineyards Reserve is such a big wine um, and it's such a high quality wine, we expect it to age fairly well. Um, but just because that's our expectation, can you kind of talk briefly about what actually goes into aging these wines and why doesn't a wine age well um, and then what are kind of some of the things that that make it that high quality fine wine ageable wine yeah no i mean there's basically there's i mean there's a list of things that make wine ageable tannins is very important acidity is very important uh, and then you also have to take into account uh, alcohol helps as well uh, sugar also helps but obviously that's irrelevant to a you know a wine like this um, but the, the fact is you have to take into account what happens as the wine ages, and I now mean in the bottle as opposed to in a barrel, uh, is that you are, the fruit profile will diminish over time. So it needs to have a structure. And what we mean when we say structure, it is those tannins and acidity particularly, uh, that give, I mean, it is almost like the architecture that the, the flavors then sit in the middle of. And if that can persist, then the wine continues to be interesting as those flavors shift as they will they become less fruity uh, and more like dried fruit mushroom you know savory qualities uh, and that can be an interesting shift you sometimes will have wines and you'll notice this this is generally speaking part of the winemaking at pedonalis is we're not these are not fruit forward you know, fruit bombs right we're not making that style of wine because we do want it to be ageable if you make a wine that is perfect when it is just fresh and fruity it's gonna be kind of disappointing probably in a few years because it just will lose that quality. 
So you, you do want to look for something where the fruit is in balance with the structure and thus can continue to be in balance even as that fruit profile becomes less fresh fruit and more dried fruit. Uh, and so that's the most important thing I would say to, to have in mind when you know, you're it also, you know, when you're looking at a wine, like, should I open it now? You're also asking yourself, well, what do you want out of that wine? Do you want to still have it when you have it while it's still a fresh fruit? Or are you willing to say, hey, I want to see what it's like when it's a little bit more mushroomy and apricot and raisiny, right? You know, because all, both of those are interesting. They're just different. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll get started on the actual wines because that's always the fun part. Um, and then if you guys, uh, David or Judy, if y'all have questions, feel free to um, type them into the chat box. Um, if you guys don't have access to the chat box or don't know how to use it, that's fine. Uh, just unmute and um, we can get those questions answered for you guys. Uh, so we're going to open up three different uh, Culkin uh, vintages. We have the 2014 and the 2015 open, which were part of that library bundle. And then we're also going to go ahead and open up the 2016 Culkin Vineyards Reserve as well, um, because we did kind of have a special add-on with that for some of the folks who wanted to take advantage of filling up the shipper box. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cover those notes as well. Um, but we'll get started uh, kind of talking about, um, and this can be a, a Julie David tag team here, um, what happened in 2014, 2015, and 2016, the actual year? Because David, you talked a lot earlier about how the year itself can heavily influence what the end result is going to be. Um, so what did happen in those years and how do you think that that affected the wine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is one of those, you sort of roll with the punches, right? Because both 2014 and 2015, we got hails hailstorms in May. So, I mean, for a matter of perspective, we butt out typically on those vines in like March, mid-March, that time frame. And a hailstorm times around then is almost perfectly timed to strip most of the fruit off the vine. So the result is that we look, we, we went into that year, into the growing part of that, that season with maybe about a quarter of the fruit we would normally have. So, one of the consequences right from the outset of something like that is, is that we're fairly restricted on our flexibility with a blend, right? Because we were looking at suddenly a lot lower yield on all of these vines, whereas we might have lots of room to work within these different lots to change the proportions. We're actually dealing with a good bit less in 14 and 15 as a result of that. We didn't make any other wines at a Colkin Vineyard AVA for that reason, because there was really enough fruit and just a little bit extra to be able to do this particular program. Um, and that, there's also, that's a lot of strain on the vines, I will point out, like to get hailstorms like this. It takes a lot of extra work to just keep the vines healthy when they're getting hailed because that's also taking foliage initially with them and they're having to put extra energy in in order to rebuild that foliage and actually kind of cover from the hail event. So again, hail is something that affects lots of regions, lots of vineyards. To get it two years in a row, it's just dumb luck. Um, like, but it is, it is what it is. And so in the, both of those vintages, the proportions on that were more driven by what was at that point available. Interestingly enough, it's still relatively similar to the proportions we do in other blends, because in the end, we just looked, you know, we were dealing with the same original proportion. I mean, everything was affected by the hail fairly equally. Uh, as I recall, it's like if I look in those blends, there are a few things that are sort of underrepresented because the hail had more impact on certain varieties that year. Um, but that from the outset changed some of the choices we made. Um, it is a very high quality vintage in that those low yields certainly meant that we were not dealing with any kind of, we were not having to do any thinning or correction on the vineyard side to get to the kind of quality level we wanted. But um, yeah, we're certainly working within the parameters that 16 is the first year, you know, is the, is the only vintage out of this set where we were dealing with a fairly rel a relatively normal harvest, albeit one where the plants are still spending that vintage recovering from getting hail two years prior. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of growing in Texas, honestly. There's, there's a lots of things that impact vineyards we look to 2020, you know, we can make a brief comment about that because this is another year where there's actually been impacts on Texas vineyards, but you know, that 
like most vintages have a story like this, depending on which region in Texas you're, you're talking about. We just had a particular impact in those first two years. So. Yeah. What's interesting about 2014, if you look at the blend and you do get this when you, you know, when you taste it, is what's missing is the Merlot and Cab from the front vineyard. Uh, unlike the others where you have components of the Merlot and the Cabernet Sauvignon, there really isn't any, at least according to the tasting notes in this first one. It, I think it does have an impact. And you also have the, the Tinta Amarello, which usually doesn't go in this blend, uh, but would be taken to go to the Colcan Alsterberg program. But in this case, probably out of necessity, it ended up being in this blend as well. Yeah. So, um, no, I think the 14 is, is tasting extremely well. Uh, yeah. I would say the fruit is still reasonably fresh. I'm getting some nuttiness, like a hazelnut, um, like a sage or savoriness to it. So, but yeah, it's still like, I mean, that shows the quality of the vintage, the fact that it's still fresh fruit, you know, now six years later. So, Marissa, what do you, do you want to add? While Marissa's unmuting herself, I just wanted to chime in real fast. If y'all will, since we're going more into the wines, kind of do a brief introduction for what the blends are. Sure. Um, I don't think they're written on the labels, so um, it would be helpful just to kind of cover on the 2014, 2015, 2016, what that blend um, is in the wine. No, for sure. I'll, I'll do those. The, that 14 is a Tempranillo, Tariga Nacional, Tinta Amarela, and Mavet blend. Um, and the proportions on that, I actually don't have in the notes. I'd have to go all the way back to our original records on this. But if, I, I believe that's sticking to a relatively steady proportion where we're talking about half Tempranillo and then kind of working down the line on the Tariga, Tinta Amarela, and Mavet. I will say Mavet played a fairly small portion in this blend in part because that was one of the most impacted varietals anyway. We had very little in. And as Julie pointed out, we didn't use the Merlot or Cab in this blend because again, to recall, there's very little in there. Um, and so you, yeah. I think you also made the block zero in 2020. And I think we may have made the, yeah, exactly. I think we may have made the block zero. We made a conscious decision to, to do that blend because yeah, we had, I think pri previously done block one, two a couple of times, but the block zero, we decided we could work out after all, those varietals, we sort of opportunistically blend sometimes with these, but they're more non-traditional when we do. Um, this, this is actually fairly close to a traditional blend, honestly, at least to the degree that you see Tinta Amarella, at least incorporated in blends like this. It's the least common, obviously, of all these varietals. Um, and the 15, let me bring that up real quick, but the 15 is, yeah, so that one is 50% Tempranillo, 20% Merlot, 15 Mavad, 10 Cabernet Sauvignon. And then we actually did use just a tiny bit from another vineyard, from one of our high blend <laughs> vineyards, we brought in some Petit Verdot. And that is, there's a little liberty whenever you're doing like an estate or AVA wine, you can blend a little outside. And we did that because that, that Petit Verdot is an incredibly good blender against that Merlot and Cap. Really brings in some of the kind of rich, Sort of dark fruit notes that you actually want to blend in with those um, and so that that's one of those rare cases where it actually has a little bit from outside our vineyard we don't otherwise we don't have petit verdot at the uh, at the estate um, so and i mean again that blend once again sort of reflecting that same those are the proportions that tempranillo at about half is that sort of foundation piece for for any blend like this uh, and then the last one on the 16 that one is 43 Tempranillo, 24 Merlot, 10% Cab, 18% Mavad, and then 5% Tariga. So, um, and again, once there, it's, you know, like we, we're shifting around the proportions, but that reflects more like we had the latitude again to kind of make decisions that suited us as far as what we wanted in this blend. In 16, we finally had a fairly uh, regular harvest, if you will, so. Yeah, I think on that 16, that Merlot is really, coming out. It's got a, a really nice fleshiness to it. Uh, just very round fruit note to it. So. Yeah, no, as I say, I do like the balance on the nose on that one. It's a little more fruit forward actually than the others. Well, that's also Dimmy. Mm, for Dimmy. sure. Yeah, just so you understand our winemaking team, uh, Dave, you know, Dave has been the winemaker for Pedernal Cellars since, uh, since 2006. Um, but uh, over time, as the program has uh, evolved and developed, we have brought in first assistant winemakers and then co-winemakers. 
Uh, and so uh, currently our uh, co-winemaker is Joanna, who couldn't be with us today uh, because we're processing fruit, apparently. <laughs> yeah, we're crushing. Yeah. But before Joanna um, came on as co-winemaker, we had Demi Metar. It's very interesting. It was interesting when all three of them were doing blends together because they all had different things they would emphasize. And one of the things I noticed with Demi, she was very honed in on the fruit. Uh, and whereas I always felt like Dave was very honed in on the structure. Um, whereas I, yeah, I feel like Joanna's always looking for something that's going to be just a little bit different. She wants to, she has, she's a super taster. She's always looking for that, like, ooh, neat note there. And I want to highlight that. So, uh, you know, every winemaker comes at it with their own, if you will, what they're aiming for, if you will. And I, I always noticed with Demi, it, it was very much oriented toward fruit, but still very balanced. So. Awesome. Well, I'm going to bring in Marissa as well here um, because I always love tasting wines with Marissa. Um, I guess we've been tasting together for what, like three years now, Marissa? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so definitely if, um, if you want to start off, we're going to start with the 2014, kind of talk about color and aroma. Um, Julie, definitely chime in as well. Um, you guys are both certified uh, through the W set. So I really enjoy um, learning from you guys and taking notes. I'm going to take notes along that way um, when I'm not pregnant and I can try these wines, uh, I can follow along again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, for 2014, I have it right here. Thank you for allowing me to taste this library wine. Um, it's such a treat um, to taste a wine that's aging so well. Um, on the nose, I really... I um, think this is fantastic in that the flavors are so well integrated. Um, that red cherry note is so deep, um, not as bright, not as tart. Um, but what's amazing is uh, the oak flavors as well, those notes. I'm getting both a smoke and freshly cut wood as well, but it's so well balanced, um, all of those notes in one. And that nose is intense enough that it's just so, so cherry on the nose, but um, those oak notes are fantastically integrated. What are you thinking, Julie? Yeah, no, I'm actually, I mean, I don't usually pick that. I mean, I, I pick up the vanilla from the, the oak, but I also pick up the coconut, which I don't always pick up. I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm just less sensitive to that. Uh, but yeah, I get a really nice plum note on this, raspberry, I mean, it's just, it's got a lot going on and, you know, it, it also gets some sage, right, some herbal notes on yes. it, chocolate, mm -hmm. right, so now yeah. this is, a, it's a beautiful wine uh, and it has, you know, and it's a, it's a good, nice, long finish and I actually get, you know, you know, what we call minerality, but it's a kind of, you know, a rocky note of some sort uh, that I think just, you know, sits on the palate really nicely. I'm also going to, as I, I told everyone in advance, I have dinner with my parents or our parents on Wednesdays. So I am going to chime off uh, and let <laughs> the other half of the tasting yeah. notes. Uh, but I will say hi to mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, say hi to mom and dad for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, so Julie. Thank you. <laughs> All right, have a good night, Julie. So that means when we join, uh, when we start talking about the 2015, David and Marissa, you guys can lead those tastings. Sure. Notes. But yeah. um, just on the 2014, so this one's going to be the most aged one that we have. Um, we did talk about that blend not having um, the Cab and Merlot. Do you think that anything um, is either uh, missing or do you think it's really enhanced by that? Uh, having the Tinta Amarillo, what do you guys think about this blend since it's very different from the other two? I mean, one of the things I get whenever I do this blend is I, this one still, the tannins stand out on this. It definitely has some, and it's, it's actually benefited for some age now where there's tannins have kind of mellowed a little bit, but it picks up well on the finish. Um, it's nice to see the fruit being what it is in here, but it does kind of edge as, you know, uh, Marissa was talking about, you got that dark cherry note, but you do get some black fruit notes in here, which, you know, not having some of the Merlot, having like a low proportion of a veg, you're not really getting as many of those sort of lighter red fruit notes that would otherwise be in here. Um, 
I actually sort of like this from a blend point of view. It would be one of my, my more preferred vintages just because I, I tend to like a good, a good sort of tannic structure like that, a little bit of grippiness in the mouth, and it really kind of holds together with the 14. So. Mm -hmm. and, and when you con it contrasts nicely when you look at the 15 because because of the other the varietal mix you get in that 15 you do get you still have that cherry note but it, it ends up being more of this kind of red cherry and this other sort of strawberry raspberry fruit sometimes it's in there on that note so awesome and julie was right uh, the sage note is so lovely i mean and it's so nicely balanced as well um yeah. so i think it's it's very very flavorful. The dark notes are fantastic, and the finish is amazing. I mean, it's lasting. I mean, that deep cherry note is fantastic on it. Perfect. And what would you guys uh, recommend as a good food pairing? And I'm going to phrase this in two different ways. As a snack, like you're just enjoying a fine wine and you're creating a charcuterie board, what's something on that charcuterie board you'd reach for with this wine? And then if you were going to design a dinner or a meal around this wine, what would you pair it with? Wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, like with the tannins on the 14, I would really like a good creamy kind of cheese. Not necessarily, I mean, it could be a brie, but honestly, some of the really good kind of rich French cheeses that'll have like a nice tang to it, um, mm -hmm. but that really thick creaminess would be nice. Mm -hmm. And then you can also cut again some real fat on like a good prosciutto or something even a little bit darker in terms of like a prosciutto meat in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, again, anytime that it's got like that sort of acidity or got those tannins, it's nice to be able to kind of get something that's similarly got some... Uh, cream to kind of go against that so absolutely mm -hmm. like a good camembert perhaps yeah that could work mm -hmm. definitely can work awesome well um i would you guys recommend because i know some folks will hear tempranillo and think that that's like an automatic gateway to spicy foods <laughs> <laughs> how do you guys think do you guys think this is another one of those red wines, you know, stay clear of the spicy, aim more for like the savory, like mushrooms and creamy sauces? Um, or do you guys think this would be okay with just a little bit of spice? I think um, pepper yeah. can pair well nice with it, nicely with it. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop my AC real fast so I can hear you guys. <laughs> All right. No worries. Yeah, no worries. Um, pepper notes, Certainly, um, but chili, spicy notes, um, I would I would stay away from. Um, mm -hmm. Nice herbal flavors would be great, and and of course, um, mushroom earth notes would pair very nicely with this. Awesome. I just had um, a pork loin that was covered in this like creamier mushroom sauce and all of that so you guys were talking mm -hmm. about this wine and I was like oh I bet you that would be amazing because all those mm -hmm. fruit notes pair so well with pork loin as well so mm -hmm. man I'd be all about that <laughs> yeah so I, my, I guess my take on spicy food is is that it's all about like how well that spice is integrated into the food because after all at some point you know like if you're talking about a spicy dish that is just you know Kind of blow you away spice a wine's going to be lost behind it no matter what the wine is um i mean granted there are still better and worse wines for trying to pair at that point but you do get into that territory where you're starting you know need some sugar with the wine simply because you need that like kind of if you, i don't know almost a relief that comes from something sweet to kind of get put against the spice but you can do some really really good rich spice that's integrated into like, like a pork dish or even like a of a spicy rub on like a steak with a lot of pepper and that can really be fantastic as long as that steak has that sort of you know juicy red meat component and has some good fatty components then yeah at that point the acids and the tannin in a wine like this and it's it's a beautiful pairing it'll the tempranillo is nice because it's it does have a lot of complementary spice notes like that sage and just some other other components but it it'll work so it it does, does depend. It can be a little hard to kind of, kind of generalize because it, it depends on the quality of the, of the food itself. So. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right, well, let's get started on that 2015 Culkin. Um, I'll ask my questions while y'all swirl and sniff and taste. Um, I'm so jealous. I really, these are some of my favorite wines. I really wish we could have done this, you know, before May. Um, <laughs> uh, so the 2015, this is where our blend now has the Cab Sauv and the Merlot in it. 
We also have that little splash of Petit Verdot from Bingham, but we no longer see those Portuguese varietals. So um, for those following along, that's how the blend has changed. We also now have one less year um, of aging in the bottle at this point. Um, I think the oak aging, if I remember right from the tasting notes, is about the same. Um, so not too much different in the oak aging program at this point. It's just the bottle aging that's different. Um, what are you guys getting? Uh, let's start with color and aroma, and then we'll move into um, the actual uh, palette notes. Yeah, this is still a deep ruby in color. So it's yeah. Yeah, so the color doesn't have quite as much. There's like a slight greater touch of oxidation to that 14, but it's not substantial. This this is a little bit more in that kind of ruby red kind of range. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I, I I will say this one stands out among all three. It's just the most kind of fruit forward of all of them. It is a really nice burst of both like kind of some red fruits. And you also get, you do get a, like almost like a plumminess that's in there as well, um, but it mm -hmm. is, it, it stands apart to me just because it's more more fruit and less. I mean, it still has some of the earthiness and a little bit of like a cedar and sage again that's in there, but that's almost almost everything that comes from that hill country. Our, our vineyard, but you know, hill country almost in general will have it. Um, but it's nice there. So, um, but yeah, I think the biggest difference to me is the finish. This has a much soft kind of set of tannins to it. The acidity and the tannins are nicely balanced, but they don't have that like kind of that grippiness that the other does. So, do you think that's partly because of the varietals that you put in there, or if, is it just by nature of the vintage? Um, I think it's a little of both. It's also, as I recall, um, and again, this is, goes to some of Demi's preference. I think there is a little bit more. Um, French and like neutral oak that's in here. So like one of the things that'll really build up you know, when you combine things like using Tariga and then putting some new oak and some American oak in there, you'll get a much more kind of strong grippy kind of tannin to that. Whereas this has a little bit more subtlety to it, which I like, it's nice. It's just a very a different, different with a very rounded finish. So. Yeah, definitely. Marissa, what kind of um, notes are you getting? Well, still that cherry, but I'm picking up a lot of blueberry on this. Yeah. And on this one more so than, a, let me take another sip here. Yeah, this one more so to me has the strawberry and raspberry notes. Um, and I do like the smooth finish that this one carries. It's really, really nice, really well blended. Have to note that I, I picked some of this fruit. It was my first harvest at Colkin, so I'm quite <laughs> proud that I had some part in picking the fruit for this. Um, but I think it's just aging so beautifully. Nice. So how does the, um, the body and the acidity compare to the 2014? Hmm. You know, it's interesting because the, I'm actually kind of curious looking at these notes. I was just kind of curious what the pH is on these. I don't know if we have it on those 15 notes. It has like a really nice roundness to the finish, but the acidity is there. Like this one is, uh, yeah, no, I mean, again, it has a good, it has a nice bite to it without being, you know, terribly acidic. Um, Again, I think it is actually one of the more balanced of some of these and that like right now at least where it's tasting, it's a very easy drink. Like it's something that, um, I mean, you can drink, you could almost drink the standalone and it's just kind of enjoyable. It's very pleasant actually, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's got a nice rounded mouth feel to yeah. it. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do y'all even want to move on to the 16 or you just want to sit here and finish your glass with the 15? <laughs> no, that's, that's, you know, that's really enjoyable. That's an easy drink to just be doing in a tasting uh, all by itself. Because sometimes with some of these, you know, you really want to like start playing around with the pairing and I do with that one too. But it is actually that finish is very, uh, very pleasurable. <laughs> it's very nice, so. <laughs> that's uh, awesome. Yeah. So do you guys have food pairing recommendations for this one? Wow. Well, this um, one would be the lamb chop. Yeah, it's not bad. I do like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't like think of this one as much for a steak as I do think of something that's kind of more, um, yeah, I don't know, like something that has like a nice kind of more sort of subtle flavors to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this could work with a chicken dish or, or like lamb chop or pork. Um, I mean, you could always get away with this with a steak, but I would feel like the others would be a better pair, at least the 14 and then we get to the 16, I think, too. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, let's taste some 2016 Culkin. Actually, I need to... What was, what was the alcohol, sorry, before we move into 2016, what was the alcohol level on the 14 and 15? Marissa, I think you have the bottles. Um, the 14, I have 13.9%. And on the 15, I have 13.3%. Oh, okay, okay, awesome. That's pretty close. To, so the 2015 and 2016 are pretty close, both in alcohol and in blend. Um, so this blend, really the main difference here is that we have Tariga instead of Petit Verdot in the 2016. Um, and again, the oak aging length of time was about the same. Um, and again, we're looking at one less year on bottle aging because we're going up in a vintage. Um, so what, how are you guys feeling about the 2016? How's that been doing? And uh, for the That's 2016, yeah, yeah, since we have a little bit less bottle aging on the 2016, if y'all want to uh, take a guess as to whether or not this is going to still age for another year, two years, five years, what you guys think on that as well? Mm. So, I mean, my first take is, is that, you know, like to, to go take on that question first, it's probably got a fair amount of ageability in it just because the tannins are pretty, fair, still fairly uh, good on this. Mm -hmm. In fact, it has a lot going for it on that front. <laughs> it's not as fruit forward to me actually as, well, definitely it's the 15, but it's even as the, um, as the 14, I get like a, like, I mean, there's like a, I don't know how to describe that note. There's like a sort of a minty, that mint, the mint and sage type notes are in there, but there's a spiciness almost like a sort of a baking spice in there too that is pretty pronounced. I mean, it has, it does does have the, the, the typical cherry notes, but even there, it's kind of more the dark cherry than it is anything else. So, like I like it, but it, I think it, it will continue to balance out a little bit more with age because right some pronounced notes as far as those like aromatics it's even got like a meatiness to it so mm -hmm. the way that note hits me with the bite and the cherry it's it's like a cherry cola um yeah that's honestly true, yeah. it really is that's awesome um but it's got wonderful body um to be at 13 one it, it's still has a wonderful mouthfeel yeah <laughs> Yeah, for reference, it's unusual for us to make 14 and up wines out of the Hill Country. Just generally, it is not the conditions we have. Um, you know, like we can we can be picking with pretty good ripeness and we're looking at like 23, 24 bricks, which translates to about that 13% alcohol range. Mm -hmm. um, like that being said, like high plains can vary more widely just because the hang times can be longer. And so sometimes we can wind up with ripeness and sugars that are coming in that are further up the scale, right? So more of our 14% and up more alcohol heavy wines do tend to come from the high plains. So. Awesome. Very cool. What else is going on with the 2016? What's, what's uh, standing out to you, Marissa? Um, so on this, yeah, I'm picking up more of the smoke notes than on the older vintages. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it's got that dark cherry note. I pick a more blackberry note on this one as well. Yeah. Mm. And the earth note, it's got this nice earth note. I mean, it's it's very mushroom to me. Um, awesome. I happen to really love it. The tannin is grippy. I, I, I enjoy it very much. Um, yeah, I, I'd say this one could age several more years at least and still be fantastic. I mean, yeah, it would age beautifully, I think. Awesome. Have a fantastic vintage and 
good thing we still have it available <laughs> because this is one that I think people should keep in their collection to sell her. Yeah. You guys are tasting this one. Well, we'll be back to tasting this one in the tasting room, right? This is in the lineup. Yes, about that. Um, so we certainly like to keep our Colk and Reserve on our wine club tasting menu. Uh, but currently, um, we have plans to continue um, having the Colk and Reserve um, mini vertical on our reserve bar tasting uh, when we get that back up and running. And um, periodically, we will put it on our main tasting menu as well. Cool. Yeah. But on that reserve tasting, you also taste, you taste the 16 and the 17, not the 14 and 15, right? That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. The special library release was uh, <laughs> certainly a treat. Right. And I was like, hey, I thought I was the only one with those bottles left. <laughs> um, I so won't the, steal them. <laughs> thanks. So for the 2016, do y'all have any different um, food pairing recommendations or is it kind of in line with what we said for the 2014 and the 2015? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, like on mine, I don't think you go wrong with the ones we've talked about. Um, mm -hmm. Like I gotta say, it's like, again, anything that's kind of got some rich kind of spicy and fatty notes would, mm -hmm. would work with this again. Like mm -hmm. Some barbecue could definitely even work with this in this case, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it is, it's nice, but I also just imagine like having this with just like some, like over like a bed of some really nice risotto, just something just really rich and just, nice. yeah, like they would, they would it would balance in well with that as well as well as with some of those really juicy meats. So. Awesome, mm -hmm. I like that. You can make risotto vegetarian as well. I have two vegetarian <laughs> sisters, so I'm always looking for some vegetarian yeah. pairings to do as well. Cool. Um, well, that is uh, just about all that I have. Um, I don't know if anyone had any other questions. Um, we're happy to help answer any of those. If you all think of questions, and I know, Judy, that you wanted me to send you some notes and everything, I'll get that to you um, for when you do uh, tasting with, I think it was your brother, if I remember correctly. Um, but we'll definitely email those to you guys. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again. I know Julie's not here. She's already left, but thanks to Julie. Um, Marissa, thank you for chiming in. I know you've got a lot on your plate. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get the tasting room up and running so that hopefully next week we can start doing tastings again. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to having our members back. <laughs> and um, David, thank you for joining in. I know you guys are in the middle of harvest and you're crushing this evening. Um, but it was really fun to be able to have you on this tasting. We always learn a lot from uh, from you. So thank you guys very much. And for those Thanks, who um, awesome. chimed yeah. in, thank you guys. And yeah, always, you're welcome. I love doing Thanks, virtual tastings yeah. and virtual things. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, like I said, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to um, send us an email. But for now, cool. till next time, cheers. Thank you. Cheers. cheers.